everyone who's taken part in the ministry of music this morning and I appreciate it so much lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 14, some of you have been invited to a, uh, a dinner before at someone's house or a church or something like that, and that's the, the setting that we have in Luke 14. I do ask that you pray for your preacher. Uh, whenever someone stands to teach the Word of God, stands to preach the Word of God, part of what you can do to assist is to intercede and to pray for the one delivering his word, delivering God's holy word. And so as you're seated there and as you say, and by the way, it's okay to say amen. Uh, uh, it's okay sometimes to say, oh me, you know, if it hits, if it hits home, you know, uh, stomps on toe or something like that. Praise the Lord and all that. That's, that's, all, that's all fine uh, in response to, to God's holy word. Um, but here in this passage, we find that the Lord Jesus was invited to a dinner and at this dinner, there were Pharisees and, and uh, teachers of the law, lawyers. And they were the, the high upper crust of the Jewish nation, many of them. And so he was invited, and it was a pretty important thing. There was a man there who had, the Bible says, the dropsy. The dropsy. I've been accused of having dropsy, you know, not holding on to stuff. Football players have had the dropsy before. Um, but he, he looked at him, and he, and he looked at the Pharisees. This was on the Sabbath day. He said, is it lawful to heal a man on the Sabbath day? And he looked around at all the Pharisees, and none of them said a word. He turned to the man with the dropsy, and he touched him, and he healed him. He turned back to the Pharisees, and, and he said, which of you would have a, a mule or, or a donkey or or an ox and falls in the ditch, wouldn't you help it out of the ditch? Kind of put the Pharisees right on, on their heels, right, right off the bat. And then he turned to those others who were, who were bidden, who were, who were invited to the same dinner. And, you know, because this was kind of a political type of thing, you know, and wanting to try to get with the right people and be seen with the right people. And so as, as there, have you ever noticed when you go somewhere to eat, once you figure out who's sitting where, the rest is easy. <laughs> you, ever, you ever been there? Well, that's, that's what they, they were... They were all jockeying for the best positions and the best seats and the best rooms and be sitting across the table from the, right, from the best people and, and to have the best conversations and all this kind of thing. So he turned to all the rest of the, of, of the folks and said, you know, when you, when you go to a wedding feast... He said, find the lowest place to sit. And if that's not where you're supposed to be, let the master of the feast find you and bring you up to the, to the better seats. Whosoever exalted himself shall be abased, but if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. So he, he addressed all the others who were, who were invited and kind of hit them between the eyes. Then he turned his attention to the one who hosted the feast. I mean, he's just telling the truth just the way, just the way it fell. Turned the one, his attention to the one who had, who had, who had uh, invited people. This is his dinner. He said, you know, when you invite people to a special dinner, don't invite the important people. Don't invite the rich people. Don't invite the, the neighbor across the street. Invite someone who cannot invite you back. Invite the maimed, the halt, the blind, the homeless. Invite those who cannot be a help back to you. He said, then your reward will come at the resurrection. I mean, boom, boom, boom. He's just, he's just helping people by telling the truth. But you know, a lot of times we just can't handle the truth. So one piped up, and when he talked about the resurrection, resurrection of the just, you know, he said, oh, it'll be good to be invited to the, to the dinner, at, to God's kingdom, God's dinner. We see that there in, in verse number 15. When one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And this introduces our text. The Bible says in verse 16, then said he unto him, a great man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time. Oh, that's a good word, isn't it? Supper time. 
Uh, by the way, we've got a little bit of time, but I know when supper time's coming around. <laughs> to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. I'll not make a comment there. <laughs> so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can look into your holy word and hear the voice of the Lord Jesus recorded for us. It is he we are here to worship. It is him that we want to glorify. And I ask you now that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to do just that. We do humble ourselves at the foot of the cross and ask for your filling and ask for your presence and ask for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Lord, may it start with me and Lord, may it continue and flood through this congregation. Lord, bless those who cannot be with us and are watching. Speak to each of our hearts, we pray. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray these things. Amen. Excuses excuses I'm told that you can go on the internet and that you can actually download a doctor's excuse that you might need for work 1495 <laughs> I was told it's doctorsexcuse.com I don't know for sure I haven't seen that but uh, Webster's defines an excuse as trying to remove blame from Trying to remove blame from. Guys, you know, there are some things we don't want to be guilty of. One of those things is forgetting important days. Um, now, take heart. There's, there's ways of sometimes uh, uh, making a, a, a vain attempt at trying to get out of uh, problems with, with her wife about these kinds of things. A husband forgot the, the birthday of his wife, and he said to her, he said, without even skipping a beat, he said, how can you expect me to, have, to know that you're having a birthday? You never look any older. <laughs> That's a smooth operator right there. Wow. You know, two wrongs don't make a right, but they sure do make a good excuse. A lot of times we try to excuse our actions when we should encourage our repentance. And here in this passage, we're, 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 we're given three excuses. And if you're looking for a title uh, of, of the message, I think this would be fitting. Excuses, excuses that are not excused. Excuses that are not excused. We can oftentimes make excuses for not following the Lord and believers' baptism. For me, my excuse was I was a little bit afraid of water. Uh, I, when I was a kid, I would go to the swimming pool and I would swim in the upper end, in the shallow end, and I would see kids swim and all that kind of thing, and I, I was just a little bit afraid of that. And growing up, I, I, I didn't really want to do that. It's in, interesting. I'm not saying this would, this would happen with, uh, with every youngster or not. But it's interesting that after I got baptized, I learned how to swim. 
That was a good thing. But we can find out all kinds of excuses for not joining a church, you know. Well, if that church had pews in it instead of old chairs, you know, I'd, it'd be more like a church, and I'd join that church. I mean, you could come up with all kinds of excuses. Excuses for not reading the, reading the Bible. Well, I don't, I don't read so good. Or I don't understand the Bible. All kinds of excuses. Or about prayer life. I, I don't know what to say, and, and we make up excuses. Excuses for not confronting others with the gospel and the good news that Jesus loved them and died for them on the cross. Excuses for not following the conviction of the Holy Spirit or forgiving or or whatever the case may be. We can find excuses. But my friend, there's one thing you better not make excuse about. Because your eternal, never dying soul depends on it. You better never make an excuse for not being saved. You see, God made a a, a very important statement. He said, our Lord Jesus said these words in verse 24, I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Let Let me put this in context, and then we'll see the three excuses. Here's the context. He's giving a parable about the kingdom of God. And he's comparing the kingdom of God to a feast, to a dinner. And, and when, they would, when they would give this kind of a banquet, it'd be a big deal. And so they would let folks know way in advance, kind of like when people send out a card to people, save the date. Uh, I want you to come to our wedding. I want you to come to our special event. 50th anniversary, we're going to have it at such such place. And we've invited you to come. And then based on those that receive and, and respond saying, yes, we will be there. We will accept this invitation. We look forward to it. Based on that, then they plan how much food to have and what, how big of a room to, to reserve and all these kinds of things way in advance. And then perhaps someone contacts you and says, hey, don't forget, our 50th wedding anniversary is tomorrow. Oh, it's tomorrow? And with one consent, they all began to make excuse, the Bible said. And here's this man. He had prepared. All these people said, yes, we'll receive. We will will come and, and be a marvelous time. God gave the invitation throughout the Old Testament, beginning all the way back in Genesis 3.15. He said, I'm going to pay the sin debt. I'm going to welcome you back into my family I'm going to pay the penalty for your sin. I invite you to the kingdom. And throughout the word of God, the Messiah, the Savior of mankind, is prophesied. David prophesied it. Isaiah prophesied it. All the way through the Old Testament. The invitation was given. And the Jews were saying, we're there, Lord, we're there. We're going to embrace him. And then the supper time had come. And the one who offered the kingdom, the one who is the Savior, the Redeemer of mankind, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, he appeared on the scene, and it's supper time. And the Lord is presenting the kingdom, and the Jews said, from him? No. And they all began to make excuse. And he is hitting the Jews right between the eyes with what they have been thrusting back into the mind and the heart of Almighty God. Much like today, much like today, people hear that God is the only, that God has provided the only way of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And they say, well, you know, I, I think I can get there on my own. You know, I I think I've got time. I'm just 22 years old. I've got a lot of my life left to live. I want to get married one day. Some people are, are come up with every excuse possible, and they want to pass the buck. They want to give an excuse. Let's look at three of these excuses that Jesus listed here. Verse 18, the Bible says, And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Such a silly excuse. 
Did you see it right there? I have bought a piece of ground, and I need to go see what it was that I bought. Craziness. Who would do such a thing? Obviously, he's, he's buying this piece of ground for his profession. I don't know if he's a farmer. I don't know if he's a businessman. He wants to flip the property. I don't know, but you don't, you don't buy a piece of property unless you're going to do something with it. And he says, this is my profession, and I don't have time to come to your dinner. There are people today that are trying to squeeze a buck uh, to get a dollar and ten cents out of a dollar. They're working hard, trying to get 26 hours out of 24, and trying their best to find some way, because they worship the almighty dollar, and they're materialistic to their core, and, and uh, there are people who have, in my life, that I've seen up close and personal, that have tried to serve mammon. And my friend, that is a fleeting goal. That is a moving target. And it never satisfies, and it never brings, it never brings fulfillment. Here's a man who said, I know that you're offering me something wonderful. I know that I don't have to pay one thing for it, but I'm too busy with my job. And he was so, uh, he's trying so rapidly to come up with an excuse it came out sideways. That happens many times to us, doesn't it? A profession that stands between me and salvation. Excuses. Excuses that are not, that are not excused. I have to work. I have to work. You know, there come a day that you cannot work anymore. Well, that's what retirement's for. Oh, really? Is that true? Talk to the people who worked so hard all their life to set aside the retirements and their 401ks, and just a few years ago, it was cut two-thirds, boom, across the board, not just you. I mean, across the board, they, they lost hundreds of thousands of dollars and are not getting it back. Strange, the day in which we live. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Yeah, I want to come, but I, I, I can't. By the way, don't, don't think for a moment that, uh, that your time of being useful to God is over. Don't think that, don't use that as an excuse. Well, you know, if I could get around like I used to, and if I wasn't suffering with such pain, and if it wasn't so difficult for me to climb stairs and all those kinds of things, I could probably do more for God. I remember when I could do, but you know, I was so busy and I just couldn't do all that. Do you remember a guy named Michelangelo? Let me remind you that whenever he laid on his back and painted in the Sistine Chapel, he was nearly 90 years of age. You know when God is done with us? Whenever he takes us home. That's when God's done with us. Until then, he has a purpose for you. Until then, he has a plan for your life. Until then, he wants to use you to point someone else to Jesus Christ, to encourage someone else who's discouraged, ready to throw in the towel. Just a smile, just an encouraging word, just that warm handshake, a hand on the shoulder, saying, I thank God for you. I thank God for your faithfulness. I look over here on the other side of the church, and you're always in your place. I just wanted you to know I notice you. Thank God for your faithfulness in serving him. You say, I can't do much, but I can do that. Well, let the Lord use you. Amen. And don't make excuse. You know, there's great joy in serving Jesus. There's great fulfillment in knowing that you've made a difference for the cause of Christ. You don't know the person that God has laid upon your heart. You don't know what they are struggling with and what they're going through. And behind the mask of that smile, what might be going on, the battle in their heart. Let God use you. Be right with him. Your profession don't let that get in the way of obeying God. And then, not just uh, professions, but possessions. Look at verse 19. The Bible says, And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Now, you've got to understand the culture here. If they were buying five yoke of oxen, they want to be sure that these oxen are going to be able to pull the plow together and work together. And so they would, they would 
test them and show them uh, before they would ever buy them. Because you might have one, one oxen that's just, you know, he's rogue. He just does his own thing and, and, uh, uh, and, and won't work with anybody. Won't work with the, with the one driving him. Won't pull alongside the other oxen. That's why the Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Because natures are different. And so just as you would probably, I would think, before you bought a car or before, before you bought a truck, I would think you'd hop in the driver's seat. I would think you'd take it on a test drive. I would think you'd, you'd hit the gas pedal in an open stretch and just see what the pickup is like, an acceleration, the brakes, check the, you live in Florida, you're going to check the air conditioning. You're going to check all the things that you know of to check, you're going to take it on a test drive. Anybody who's worth their salt is going to do that. Here's a guy saying, I have bought not one, not two, five yoke of oxen. That's ten oxen. That's a whole corral. I don't know how much horsepower that is. That's a lot of pulling power. Now that I bought ten of them, I'm going to see if they're any good. Billy Sunday said, an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. And that's what happened. He said, I, I, please have me excused. His possessions were more important than the invitation. God can take away our possessions. He can take them away. And have you noticed that whenever you get a possession... Have you noticed that when you bargain for the best price, you might go to Amazon and Google and go to Best Buy and go to the hardware store and go and, and, and find the best price and get your Sunday paper and see what's on sale and all that kind of thing, and you find the best price, and you've zeroed in on it, and you bring it home, and you get it, and you open it up, and sure enough, it works, and it's wonderful, and you use it one time, and it goes on the tool bench. You might use it again in three or four weeks just to remind yourself you're glad you bought it. And then a few months later, it's got about an eighth inch of dust on it. <laughs> Things don't satisfy. Possessions. Profession. Look at the last one here, verse 20. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Now, he gives it away by the first word of his sentence. He makes it sound like he really cares about his wife, but the first word of his sentence is, I. He gave himself away. I have married a wife. It, 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 in essence, he was saying, I'm a husband. I'm a husband now. I've married a wife. I'm a husband. And uh, uh, I've got better things to do Folks, listen, please. When we put our anything, and may I carefully say this, if we put our family above God, we're endangering our family. We're endangering our family. It is God. It is spouse. It is children. And then everything else falls under that say, oh, wait a minute, children, no, no. You see, if, if the marriage doesn't work, the children are in danger. Keep everything in priority. Keep everything in God's order of authority. It's God first, spouse second, children next, job, and everything else, all, all in, in God's order of, of priority, in God's order of emphasis. And the Lord Jesus is giving this parable, and he's saying, oh, okay, I'm not saying that, that a profession, I'm not saying your job is a bad thing. If a man does not work, neither should he eat. And if a man provides not for his own, the Bible says he's worse than an infidel. And so uh, the Lord is not saying that we shouldn't work. We should work hard, harder than anyone in the world. But putting our job before God? No, 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 no. And then our possessions... He has given us all things richly to enjoy. What a great thing. 
The things that we, that we have today are just, just boggle the mind. But sometimes we cherish those to the exclusion of worshiping God. And then our position, our position. I'm a teenager. I don't have to serve God right now. I'm, I'm, I'm 14 years old. Anybody in here 14 years old? Anybody at all? Anybody at all 14 years old? How about, how about 13 years old? Okay, we got some right over here. Okay, good. I'm a young person. I'm 17. I'm just newly married, you know. We've, we've, got, we've got just uh, starting a new family. Or I've got responsibilities. I've got, to, I've got to take care of my kids and send them to college. I've got all these things upon my shoulders. I'm a senior citizen, and I'm just struggling to make it through. It's difficult for me to get to church. God knows all those things. And he says this. He says, those that said no to me. Now think about it. These are the Jews, the Jewish nation, Israel, that he came to redeem. Came to redeem the sins of the whole world, but he came through the Jewish nation. He came through as a promise to to Abraham of old. And now, as generally as a nation, they are refusing him. And so as a result, the one who bid the, the banquet, he said, go out to the highways and hedges, and compel everybody you can to bring in. And guess what? I'm one of those. I'm one of those. I'm a Gentile. I praise God that that he reached out to everyone, and he's reaching out to you. Why is it that you have not received Christ as your Savior? Well, I'd be embarrassed. Uh, I'm I'm ashamed. I'm, I'm struggling. With, with all this. You've heard me tell the story about my sweet wife. How as a youth pastor's wife, she said this uh, when we were talking, uh, giving folks an opportunity to tell uh, when and where they were saved. And uh, she just said the, two, the three words, youth pastor's wife. That's all she said. She didn't go into it. As a youth pastor's wife, she was struggling from a little girl, wee, wee little girl, as someone with, with great... Um, Good motivations. Had her pray a prayer that she didn't understand. Told her about sin that she didn't, she didn't grasp. The thought of turning back to God or repenting or anything like that, was, she didn't understand any of those things. Said, if you want to go to heaven, pray. That, I want to go to heaven. Sounds like fun to me. And that was what she was leaning on for her salvation. Now, she was believing in Jesus Christ. Her faith and trust was not in her works. Her faith and trust was in the shed blood of Christ. But God would not leave her alone that there was not a point in her life when she was born again that she could look back to that she turned from her sin and asked Jesus Christ to save her. She felt like she was saved, but she didn't know, didn't have it nailed down. She struggled with that going through Christian school, going through Christian college, and now as as a full-time youth pastor's wife, full-time at the church. She came to the point that she said, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I care what God knows. And she settled it. What excuse are you hanging on to? Is that excuse worth spending eternity in the lake of fire? Let me share this with you. The Spirit came in childhood and pleaded, let me in. But oh, the door was bolted by thoughtlessness and sin. I'm too young, the child replied. I will not yield today. There's time enough tomorrow, the Spirit went away. Again he came and pleaded in youth's bright, happy hour. He came but heard no answer, for lured by Satan's power. The youth lay dreaming then. And saying, not today, not till I've tried earth's pleasures. And the spirit went away. Again he called in mercy, in manhood's vigorous prime. But still he found no welcome. The merchant had no time. And so repulsed and saddened, the spirit went away. Once more he called and waited. The man 
was old and ill and scarcely heard the whisper. His heart was cold and still. Go, leave me. When I need thee, I'll call for thee, he cried. Then sinking on his pillow, without a hope, he died. When God calls, it is because we stand in danger of eternity. I'm told that Niagara River has signs, even when the river is very flowing and very soft in nature, way up, way up the, the way, there are some warning signs that are posted on both sides of the river. But then there comes a place that there is a sign on both sides, and it says this, point of no return. The current is so strong that sometimes even the boats with the strongest engines and propellers might not be able to break the current. The point of no return leads then to Niagara Falls plunging to their death. I don't know where that line is, but Jesus said that these men had crossed the line. These men who were rejecting the invitation. And he did it in a parable form. He did it in a way that they understood the conviction of God and still turning away. And it is that kind of disbelief that placed Jesus Christ upon the cross who was nailed for your sins and for mine. What is it that is keeping you from obeying and answering God's call? What excuse? Is it because... You think you have enough time. There are people who have gotten sick, started coughing. I just mentioned the word coughing. Expect someone to start coughing now. And they find themselves in the hospital, and all across the country they're dying. There are people who get behind the wheel of a car, and never even, never even thinking that today is their last day on earth. What is your excuse? I invite you to receive the gift of salvation. I invite you not to turn Jesus away. He loved you so much. He died on the cross. Let's bow our heads together, please. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. A very simple message. But I ask you here today to turn your attention into your own heart. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you were to close your eyes in death for the last time, and you were to open your eyes in eternity, where would you be? I'm sure you would say, well, I, I, I hope I'd be in heaven. What are you basing that on? If that's your blessed hope, upon the promise of Almighty God and His Word, that you've reached up with the hand of faith and He's reached down with the hand of grace. And He has applied the sin, the, the sin-covering blood of Jesus Christ to your name and to your account. Say, yes, I've done that. I've repented of my sin and asked Jesus Christ to save me. And my friend, your ticket is paid. Your home is reserved in heaven for you. If you would say, preacher, I don't think I've done it quite like that. It may be that, that I'm kind of like hope. That there were some things that happened earlier on in my life, but God won't leave me alone about this. I'm just not sure that I'm saved. Wouldn't it be great to have that settled and walk out the doors of this church knowing that heaven's your home? knowing that Jesus Christ is in your heart and life, never to leave you nor forsake you. This church cannot get you to heaven, but we can point you to one who can. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, would you pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life and to save you right here, right now, and not make any more excuses? Just say, I'm going to settle it today, Lord.
Today would be the day of my salvation. Would you reach up in faith? He'll reach down in grace, and he'll save you today. Would pray something like this, would you? You don't have to pray it big and loud. He'll hear you where you sit. Whisper this to God. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose again from the grave, just like the Bible says. I ask you to forgive my sin. Come into my heart and my life and save my soul. I'm trusting you, Jesus, to take me to heaven one day. Until then, help me to live for you. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name. Without embarrassment, and I will not point you out, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you would say, Brother Mark, is best to know how. I did pray that prayer, and I meant it. God has spoken in my heart, and I answered his call today, and I asked him to save me. Would you slip your hand up and take it right back down? If that's your testimony, God bless you, sir. I prayed that today. Who else? Who else? I prayed that and asked Jesus to save me. Just slip it up and take it down so I can see it. I want to rejoice with you. It is good for you to praise God for what he's done in your heart. It'll bring joy. It'll bring God's direction. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. No one's looking. Anyone else? Anyone else? I rejoice with you. Praise God. Now, Lord Jesus, I come to you thanking you that you are still the prayer answering God. And Lord, of all the prayers that we could ever pray, the one that we know the most, that, we're, that we have confidence that you are 100% going to answer. And that is the sinner's prayer to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. I thank you for this gentleman who raised his hand. Not ashamed of you, not ashamed of what you've done in his heart and his life. I pray, Lord, that you would assure him with your Holy Spirit's presence in his life and in his heart. Bring peace to his, to his soul. And Lord, I pray now that you would help him to grow in you and help us to grow in you as, as we ought. Lord, there might be some here that need to join this church. And they're saying, I'm not going to make excuses anymore. I'm not going to worry about this, not going to worry about that. Lord, you're leading them. I pray that they would follow you. Lord, there are some that need to get baptized. Never been, never been baptized since they got saved. I pray that today that they would follow you in obedience and not make any excuse. Lord, there are some that need to pray for boldness to witness. May they come and bow the knee and say, Lord, I pray that you would give me the words to say and the, and, and the willingness to obey. There are some that need to confess a lack of reading your word and, and, and a consistent prayer life. May they come and seek your forgiveness and ask for your faithfulness in their life. Lord, may we just as Christians humble ourselves at the foot of the cross. And may you use us to point others to Jesus. In Jesus' precious name. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. If God has led you to join this church and go to work for God here, I invite you to come on the first word of the first verse that we sing. If God has led you to be baptized, you, we can baptize you today, we can baptize you next Sunday, but please don't walk out the doors without acknowledging, yes, Lord, I heard your call. I'm going to be obedient to your direction. If you're a Christian and God has convicted your heart to a new level of obedience, Bible reading, prayer, soul winning, whatever the case may be, you come and bow the knee and say, Lord, I've heard your voice. Don't delay on the first word of the first verse. Everyone come and don't make excuse. Let's stand together.